it is critical that you have a well-diversified portfolio and that you control your wealth. Because if you allow Wall Street and the central banks and the governments to control your wealth, well, frankly, they've been confiscating it from you since the day, since the moment that you were born. This is part two of the Fed Financial Stability Report, where I'm going to show you that risks are rising rapidly. We're going to look at the biggest risks to the financial system, including risks to the debt markets, money markets, your annuities that you think are so safe, and more. And we're going to talk about how you can protect your wealth from crisis confiscation. Coming up. I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full service physical. Because if you don't hold it, you don't own it. And in this day and age, it is critical that you have a well diversified portfolio and that you control your wealth. Because if you allow Wall Street and the central banks and the governments to control your wealth, well, frankly, they've been confiscating it from you since the day, since the moment that you were born. So I don't think that's a very good idea. And now what are the feds telling us in their most current financial stability report? That the risks are rising. So I got to ask you, are you ready for this ride? Because if you're not, you need to get ready now. You know, everybody always wants to know when. Well, let's just say when. We're very, very close as I showed you in part one. But let's take a look at some of the salient risks to the financial system. Now, this was the last survey that they took this on. This was in November of 2021. So a shocker, because nobody really knew that we know of, that, the, uh, that Russia was going to invade Ukraine. But this is a huge risk to the global financial system. Um, some of that comes from Russia being cut out of the SWIFT system, which is the global payment system based on the dollar, and almost being forced into a default, which a default could easily ripple through and topple, frankly, the global financial system. So they're, they're dancing with that, but there's been no conclusion yet. Secondly, persistent inflation coupled with monetary tightening, right? So, I mean, I mean, seriously, every time there's a new report that comes out on inflation or inflation expectations or anything else, any levels of inflation in different areas, anymore it's... This was a surprise. They were expecting it better and it came out worse. It's a shocker. So all of these professional economists that dictate and say, well, this is what we think is going to happen. The central banks that say, this is what we, th I mean, remember inflation was transitory. Now it's persistent. Did we not talk about how persistent it was from the beginning? Actually, did we not talk about that when the Fed changed from targeting their 2% two for, two inflation to an average? Remember that? I said, I hope you're ready for inflation because here it comes. And as it turns out, not so transitory. So we've got persistent inflation and monetary tightening. So in other words, this is where they're going to raise the interest rates to diminish demand because the theory is then that will slow down inflation. So they have to raise rates for their credibility and also to give them the opportunity to lower them before because they tested negative rates. Didn't really work real well, did it? No, it did not. So they need to raise the rates 
just so later on in the year they have the ability to lower them again to stimulate the economy by making taking on debt cheaper. Yeah, makes a whole lot of sense to me. How about to you? And then risk asset valuations and a correction. And as we know, the stock markets have been flirting with a 20% correction, but I'm pretty sure the plunge protection team is in there going, no, no, we don't want anybody to know this. However, this correction that we're in right now, my personal feeling on it is that the Federal Reserve and other central banks globally will be forced to pivot once again and inject massive amounts of free money into the system, but it's not going to work. All that's really going to do is finalize sending us into the hyperinflation that I believe has already started. We're already at the beginning phases because all that new money that they've already put inside of the stock market, the bond market, the real estate market, raising rates could easily be popping those bubbles and all that wealth has it's going to decline in a very big way correction yeah and of the of those surveyed it more than doubled uh the people that thought that the correction the asset values were too high and we were going into correction well you can see the results of that and here's the other thing that we've been talking about now foreign divestment from u.s assets And the U.S. dollar holds less and less share of the global uh, funding inside of the Swiss system. Fewer countries are holding as much dollar reserves. And, uh, you know, this is a big, this is, well, it's everything is either good or it's bad. But the reality is, is that it was already in 2002 that we no longer attracted foreign countries buying our debt. And that's why the Federal Reserve had to start buying it. Back in 2002, though, you never heard anything about it because that's more of what a third world country does. Except now the whole world is doing that. So basically what we have is the global central banks financing all of this government spending. It's really, really interesting. We are in, I mean, we are living in the single most interesting times that I think we could have ever lived in. And nobody was really talking about that back in November of 2021. That came up in this May report. But we have also been talking a lot about the U.S. dollar losing its status as the world reserve currency and that is definitely happening so that could also help push us into hyperinflation on a much higher level and my personal feeling is that the hyperinflation will be worse in the u.s as we lose that status of the world reserve currency and then finally higher energy prices i mean You know, this was an issue back in 2020, November 2021, and 8% of the contacts surveyed said this was a concern. Now we're at 41%, and today crude was topping $118 a barrel. And you've got, you know, Jacqueline, who you've heard me talk about before, she put just shy of $100 in her gas tank the other day. Okay, if you have... You know, if you have some level of wealth, you can afford it. It's annoying, but big deal. It's not going to determine whether or not you can put food on the on the table. But for a lot of people, a lot of people putting $100 worth of gas in your tank versus putting food on the table, people have to make those choices. And that is a very precarious and scary place to be. These are all of the risks and more. There are more to the financial system and why I'm telling you and why I feel like we are very close to coming to conclusion. Plus, we're now entering the second half of 2022. And you might recall that I said 2022 is a pivotal year, 
going into 2023 when so many things around the interest rate benchmarks and all these new positions are being put in place. So I think we've got, you know, the six month window to really get everything dialed into place to get you prepared to handle this ride and weather this storm because I think the next crisis is very, very close. But let's look at debt first because this is a debt fueled economy. So we're going to look at the outstanding amounts of non-financial business and household credit. Well, the opposite side of credit is debt. So if you use your credit, you are now in debt. Let's take a look at this. This is the growth of the debt and percentage between the fourth quarter of 2020 and the fourth quarter of 2021. And this is the average annual growth rate, which actually includes these very high numbers. So a few things that I wanted to point out to you. Total non-financial business credit or business debt tops $18.5 trillion in notional value. So that's the value of those contracts. That's actually gone down. The app, the percentage has actually gone down a little bit from 5.8 to 4.5. So non-financial business debt has been growing slower than the average between 1997 and the end of 2021. And again, the high numbers are in there as well. Let's look at total household credit. 17.9 trillion, and that's actually jumped a substantial amount from an average of 5.4 to 7.3. So households that, was, that were given all of the stimulus money well, as I showed you last week in the, uh, in the savings rate, we're, we're lower than we were pre-pandemic, and now we're taking on more debt. And most of that debt is coming from mortgages and consumer credit, so uh, credit cards, as well as auto loans and revolving credit, so HELOCs and things like that. And those have actually moved up in a pretty substantial way. But nominal GDP, so that's all the money that flows through the U.S. system. Whenever you buy something or you get paid something is only $24 trillion. So we've got total private non-financial credit, so businesses and households, of $36.5 trillion. That's 152% of the GDP. That is dangerous. So with the company, with, with the central banks and the government looking to the consumer to avoid a recession when they're already loaded with debt and they're out of savings, that means that in order to continue to shop, they have to take on more debt. They better not lose their jobs because how do you repay that debt? And when you have debt, you either have to make the payments on that debt, pay it off, roll it over, or default on it. So do we have a lot of defaults in our future from both these zombie corporations as well as people that are trying to sustain a standard of living that is constantly further and further out of their reach because the cost to buy these goods and services is moving so much more quickly than their income to service all of this. Can you see the problem? And, you know, how is this going to get resolved? You think we're going to be able to grow our way out of it? Because we're now in a rising interest rate environment, at least for the time being. I don't think that's really going to hold true very long. And we'll see. You know, maybe through the rest of this year, maybe not. It depends on how scary it gets out there for the Fed. 
gets gets scary enough, markets implode enough, the prices on housing really start to go down in a very dramatic way, where now you have all of these people that are underwater because the current market value of their homes went down or the commercial real estate went down, we're in deep doo-doo. And this is going to be, I think the next crisis is very close. I don't think it's tomorrow, but who knows, right? Timing is the biggest challenge of any technician. So let's break down that business debt a little bit more because what you're looking at here is the net issuance of risky business debt. That's, those are their terms, not mine. Net issuance of risky business debt. Keep in mind that this is intangible, right? You want to have a properly diversified portfolio, but you know, these things are packaged up, whether they're leverage loans, which is really the biggest part of this debt at the moment, um, are leverage loans. So that's layers of debt, layers of debt, leverage, right? It makes it riskier because you have to have the income to service it. And that takes us to this next place, which is the distribution by debt to EBITDA. EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Okay, so distribution by debt to earnings, basically. And what I want to point out to you, we talked about the leverage that's debt upon debt upon debt upon debt for the same asset. Debt multiples of over six times, which is the highest that they go in here. So we don't really know, but look at how much that has grown. That's this brown area here. Look at how much that's grown since 2010. But even more interesting than that, frankly, is look at where it was in 2007 before the financial crisis, or as the financial crisis was unfolding. And now the level of leverage in the system is greater than it was leading up to the financial crisis in 2007 and 2008. How good does that make you feel? Especially when we had them talking, uh, the central banks talking about the level of liquidity, your ability to buy and sell without moving prices too much, it's shrinking. This is not a good thing. This puts you in a very precarious position, whether you realize it or not, because you don't even see it. And what's even worse is that this is the stuff that you're likely holding in your 401k or your IRA or your pension plan because institutional investors invest your money that you dutifully put into these things every single week or month or however you get paid. So you are paying to take on this ridiculous level of risk. That's why the general public always eats it in the shorts during these things, because that's the way the system is set up. If you hold gold, you hold it, you own it. It has no counterparty risk. All of this, massive. It's all 100% counterparty risk. Money market breaks the buck and freezes redemptions. That's September 17th, 2008. What was the response to that? Well, don't change behavior, just change how you account for that behavior. So what they did was they changed the rules of money markets. Now, this is also intangible and people think about money markets like savings, but I want you to just kind of look at this because this is what happened in 2008 when you halted your ability to redeem from what you thought of like a very safe and secure savings. So they put in money market reform and you can see the changes to that reform. Once they worked on the reform between 2008 and then they actually implemented it in 2016. That's not that long ago. That's what, five, six years ago 
when these new money market reforms took place. And you can see this brown area here are government money markets. So it really benefited uh, the government because people felt safer in there. But you still have all these other money markets. And, and just because they're government, I mean, do you really still think that government bonds are safe, for goodness sakes? Because they can print the money that they need to pay you. But the value of that money that they pay you with, well, that's what's not stable. Price stability doesn't mean things stay the same. Price stability means that employees don't ask for more money from employers because their perception is that prices aren't changing that quickly. Forget that, that's gone. But you can see that they are now, again, talking about additional money market reform so that you can't even run from the government funds. 2021. In December, the SEC published for public comment a proposed money market uh, fund reform package that includes a requirement that those prime and tax exempt funds that are offered to institutional investors, so that's, remember, institutional investors invest your money. Uh, let's see, so that they adopt swing pricing, which, if properly calibrated, could reduce investors' incentive to run from funds amid stress, which means that there are going to be higher and higher liquidation fees so that you choose not to take your money out. Think about this. When they set up the IRAs, they don't want people using that as a piggy bank. They want that money to be sticky. They want you to put that in there because then they can determine the tax they can generate from you. They can see all of your wealth, et cetera, right? So what did they do? Now you look at your account and say you got a hundred grand in there and you go, oh, I got a hundred grand in there. But actually after taxes, maybe you only have 50 or 60 grand in there. But your perception is that you have a hundred. So if you want to do something else with that money, what's your response? Well, I don't want to pay those taxes. Guess what? You ain't never getting away from paying your taxes. So you have to be strategic about it. But when they set these systems up, whether it's money markets, IRAs, pay, whatever, whatever it is, they know that you will be incentivized to stay put if the fees are high enough for you to notice. And that means that you then, the cost is the vulnerability of your wealth and even getting any of your wealth back. Because guess what? If it's all intangible, like all this stuff, and they say no, what are you going to do? Now, the next piece that I really want you to think about a lot is the insurance company piece. Because in life insurance companies, leverage remains high Leverage at life insurers remain near its highest level of the past two decades. Life insurers continue to invest heavily in corporate bonds. Okay, remember how bonds work? Interest rates go up, principal values go down, and vice versa. Collateralized loan obligations, CLO, which are very similar to the CDOs that froze in 2008, and CRE, which is commercial real estate, which leaves their capital positions vulnerable to sudden drops in the value of these risky assets. And anything that you are holding, like, oh, I don't know, an annuity, which are issued by life insurance companies, if you look at your contract that you got back after you signed on the dotted line, go through it. You know what you're going to see? It's based upon the claims paying ability of the company. So the fact that they're using a lot more leverage in here and that they're also investing in things that are not very liquid to begin with means that if you're counting on that annuity for your retirement, it just might not put you in the best position. Oh, well, that can never happen. Well, 
It can't happen until it happens, and then what are you going to do about it? So I'm not saying, look, you've got to do what you're comfortable with, regardless of what anybody says. But this is the importance of having a properly diversified portfolio. And Wall Street wants you to think that that means stocks and bonds and real estate. But if they're all intangible, you're not diversified at all. They're all dollar denominated. It's just a little sleight of hand trick. But this is the leverage of life insurance companies. And as you can see, it's higher than it's been going back two decades. And again, and I, and really don't take my word for it. Pull out your contract if you have it and you're going to see it, that it's based upon the claims paying ability of the life insurance company. So they better be able to pay you and who knows. The other thing that they talked about in this financial stability report are stable coins. And you always have to be careful <laughs> by any name because that means that it's probably just the opposite. And like money market funds that were designed to make you feel like, well, these are like a savings account and they always stay at a dollar, which the underlying assets in them do not. They might be above, they might be below, but the um, money market funds always wanted you to just see it at a dollar. And the same thing with the stable coins, that's how you're supposed to think about it. But the assets underneath them could be very, very different. Maybe they're liquid, maybe they're not. We don't really know that. But what we do know is that they're subject to runs and they are intangible. And the test has begun on not just stable coins, but all cryptocurrencies. So we'll see what happens because this is really the first time that they're being tested. Terra USD or UST is an algorithmic stable coin that's supposed to work like its centralized counterparts like Tether or USD coin. But instead of maintaining a constant price, its value plummeted far, far below a dollar since Saturday as all of the mechanisms to maintain its value stopped working because these are algorithms. You need to have a properly balanced portfolio. The Federal Reserve also warned that stable coins are vulnerable to runs and this is the run. Can you see it? That's the run. I'm not saying that you should or you shouldn't hold any of these other intangible assets, but I am saying that you need to make sure that whatever you're going to risk over here, you've got insured with gold over here. The increasing use of stable coins to meet margin requirements. In other words, they borrowed to buy more cryptos in leverage crypto trades may heighten redemption risks because as we see with gold, which is actually physical gold is in your possession and runs no counterparty risk, but even intangible gold, like through ETFs, GLD or other ones, you don't own the underlying asset. You own a share in an intangible trust. So all I'm saying to you is you better make sure that your portfolio, if you're going to hold these other intangibles, has physical gold on the other side of this to make sure that you are properly diversified. Because gold, physical gold, is the only financial asset that has the broadest base of buyer. And you can see it right here. Technology, central banks, bar and coin investment, jewelry, ETFs, and it's also in medicine and in food on and on and on. So you have the broadest base of functionality along with the broadest base of buyer. What do you want going into a crisis? something where they can run away from it or something that you hold, you own, and you have a whole plethora 
of entities that are ready to buy it from you. It's pretty simple because we all know this, and this is just a fact. If you don't hold it, you don't own it, and your perception is irrelevant in a court of law. So I want you to make sure if you haven't yet watched part one, make sure that you watch part one of this video. It came out on Tuesday. And also make sure that you tune in to Beyond Gold and Silver channel where I just did a video on social unrest, which is part of the whole mantra. Food, water, energy, security, barterability, wealth preservation, community, and shelter. And if you haven't started your own gold and silver strategy, please click that, do yourself a favor, click that Calendly link below and set up a time to talk to one of our consultants. Because we'll set up your own personal strategy based upon your goals and your circumstance. Do yourself a favor, get it done today. And if you've already done it, but you haven't finished your strategy, please get it done. I know I'm feeling very urgent. I know that I have believed that 2022 is going to be a pivotal year and probably the last full year that we would have to get properly into position. And quite honestly, there are a lot of things that I've moved up because I'm afraid that if I don't do them now, I'm not going to be able to. Maybe I'm wrong. Timing is the biggest challenge of any technician. But I can tell you, I feel better knowing that I have my I have my wealth properly positioned and I have my food, my water, everything else. Please get it done. If you like this, please give us a thumbs up. Make sure you leave a comment because that helps the algorithm for YouTube so we can spread this word more and more. And until next we meet, Please be safe out there. Bye-bye.